Just to introduce myself to you, I'm the Bavar Chief. All right. Uh, so after this great lunch we had today, I mean, tea break was cancelled, all thanks to me out here. Um, as you can see, it's very obvious, I love to eat. I really, really love to eat. And I truly believe when there's a crisis, and if we can get people to eat normally once again, things are already all right. You don't need to worry about it anymore. And the only other thing that I love as much as I like to eat is to travel. And if you're as lucky as I am, who can combine the two together, well, you're going to heaven, all the way first class, of course. Uh, I'm a brat, sorry. <laughs> uh, many people, you know, have asked me always, in fact, these kids were also asking me, what's my educational qualification, which catering college I've been to, et cetera, et cetera. You know, when I was young, I used to get very embarrassed and I used to make, say, oh, I did a course in that, you know, correspondence or something. The truth is I barely managed to finish school, all right? I was a lazy kid. I was bunking classes, going and seeing dirty dancing instead of giving my exams. So there wasn't any scope for me in any good college. So I said, what the heck? I mean, I'm meant to do better things in life. So let's do the only one thing that I know apart from you know, bullshitting my way around is to cook. And that's how I became a chef. And today I have to admit, I take great pride in saying that actually I'm very lucky because the education that I've had is the best of sorts. And the best part about it, it never ends. So I don't think many parents are gonna be happy in this audience if there are any. Um, but really, travel is an education. Just to give you an example, when I was about 18, I went to the island of Sicily, which is absolute south of a uh, south tip of Italy, and my local friends there said, Ritu, you got to try our local speciality, panelle and marzipane. Yeah, wonderful, I'm very excited. Uh, one bite of panelle, that was basically besan ka bhajia, and uh, <laughs> marzipane, which was badam barfi, all right? And then, Next trip is in Turkey, a little village in Kursadasi, and this local lady, all dressed in her Turkish clothes, gives me a glass with a red drink, a fermented drink. Very excited, one sip. This is kanji, gajar ki kanji. So, as I said, who needs history lessons? Who needs education? Just by eating with these locals in their local environment, I had a pretty good idea of the countries who were the invaders and the countries who were invaded, really. Uh, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> you know, I'm sure, I mean, my first love is Italian food. It's really something I've always loved. And when you think Italian food, what are the two things that comes in your mind? The f pasta and pizza, yes. Everyone thinks of the same way. So it was quite shameful when I went to Italy and I realized that both pizza and pasta don't actually belong to Italy. Uh, pizza is actually Persian by origin, that's where naan came from, and pasta actually was taken to Italy by Marco Polo from one of his trips to China. Shame on Italy, really. Two things, that also they couldn't get it right, they had to borrow it from someone else. Uh, but that's what I'm saying, at the end of the day, you eat, you travel, and education actually comes on its own. You know, I don't know, all of you aspire to travel or travel, I'm sure it's something, I mean, food and travel are two things that we all love. So how many of you would like to go on, let's say, a culture holiday? A beach holiday, for example. Okay, you guys want to go every sort of a holiday, all right. <laughs> So when I do my holiday, I do it in a very particular way or any trip that I do, I make a list of all the restaurants I want to eat at. I make a list of all the chefs I want to impress and I want to make a list of all the dishes that I'm cooking but I'm not so sure whether it tastes exactly the same as it would 
in its own authentic environment. And that's how my trips are decided, not based on destinations, but actually on the dishes, the street food markets, and the chefs I want to meet. And I have to admit, it's really been fabulous. Today, everything that I cook is based on these trips, based on the recipes I've stolen from God knows where all, but I do give them all credit. In fact, if any of you have eaten at any of my restaurants, you will see whether it's Cafe Diva or Latitude, there are always dishes which are named after certain people. Basically, with or without their consent, it's their recipes which I have recreated uh, in our restaurants. So, I was in Burma a few years ago. One amazing country it is. Uh, Bagan temples, it's really a sight, especially when you see it in the morning, you know, from a hot air balloon during sunrise. But you know what's better than that? is the avocado condensed milk shake. So sweet, so creamy, at least 4,000 calories. And I used to drink three of them every day, you know? Then I made a trip to Petra, you know, the ancient city, the city, the rose city as they call it. And when I came back, all my friends wanted to look at the pictures I had taken till I looked at the album. And there were only pictures of Baba Ganosh and uh, warm pita bread and the various medze. I said, okay, this is going to sort of get me into trouble. But what the heck, I mean, that's what I make my living out of. Then we have London. Let's admit it, every summer you go there, half of Delhi and Mumbai is sitting in London. You know, we have a great connection, the Raj, the Queen, you know. We, all, we almost feel we are Brits in any case. But what you don't know, there's an amazing chocolate shop there. It's called Rococo. And this tiny chocolate shop on King's Road makes its own handmade chocolates every morning. And if you remember, there was a movie called Chocolat a few years ago. So that movie was actually based on this 150 square feet chocolate shop. So who cares about the Big Ben or the Queen for that matter? No offense. It's the Rococo that one needs to go to London for. Uh, a few years ago, I had done a TV show called Travelling Diva. And uh, the book was also by the same name. And it did quite well, actually much better than I had expected it to do. I would like to believe because I have a cute face, you know, a smile which dazzles in front of the camera. Uh, I mean, these things are true, of course. But uh, if I'm really honest, the reason why Travelling Diva did so well was India had changed. It had really changed. By the time Travelling Diva was showing on NDTV, Indians were travelling, and they were not travelling in the sense that they were carrying their puri, sabzi, matri, achar, khakra with them. They were going and eating and trying out different food at different places, and when they came home, they wanted to recreate the same recipe back in their home, that little pate that they had in this little village in Tuscany. So, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a country which is changing. You know, in fact, I met one gentleman this afternoon at lunchtime who told me that he used to come to my first restaurant, Mezza Luna, way back in 1993. And I told him, you didn't come often enough, otherwise I wouldn't have had to shut it down. So, <laughs> Uh, in 1993, when Mezza Luna had opened, I used to really get into serious trouble because people used to say, Sirka wala piyaz kai? They say, Mac Italian restaurant? Macaroni, baked beans kyo nahi hai? All right? So there I was trying to prove to the city that it's time to eat Italian food, real Italian food, but it didn't work. And today, we can't sell enough of authentic Italian food and not only just Italian food, people want regional food. And they want it, and they want it all, and they want it as authentic as it gets. This is what's changed about India, and that's what's so amazing about it. In fact, I was going to Amritsar, driving to Amritsar. The plan was to stop at a dhaba, you know, eat the Amritsari kulcha with safed makhan, rasse misich hole, you know, with imli and all. So, <laughs> great, stopped at the dhaba. So we all go wash our hands and sit down. The guy comes, Satsya Kalji, kya khaoge? And I said, Kamrisari kulcha and chana. He said, that's all right, madam, but today's special is penne pasta with tomato cream and chili sauce. <laughs> all right? <laughs> 
So, this is globalization. But talking about globalization, there's another story I have. So, this is about 10 years ago. I was shooting for my first book, Italian Khana. Um, NDTV had no money, they never do. And uh, so, it was a crew, one, uh, my producer, Monica Narula, and a cameraman, Jalaj, brilliant man. And all of us had rented a big van. And I had to more or less beg everyone I knew in Italy to give us free khana and free shooting time because we had no money. So that TV serial was basically based on Italian ingredients. Because 10 years ago, for me, what was very important was that people first understood the ingredients to actually appreciate the cuisine in its totality. So we were shooting this episode on Parmesan cheese. Parmesan is made in a small village called Sorania in the north of Italy. Population is about 2,000 people. So our host, he has invited us for dinner and very excited. He says, a 20-seater restaurant. I've made a reservation two weeks in advance. Yeah, all good. There's one problem. Jalaj, my wonderful cameraman, he hates everything which is non-Indian. He hates it. And that's a small problem. The bigger problem is he's highly allergic to cheese. So we are going, we are eating in this, we enter, and I'm really nervous because I'm in charge of this bunch of kids. You know, all these TV people are seriously childish in their behavior. And uh, on one hand, I don't want to sort of be disrespectful to the host and, you know, offend him. On the other hand, I know if Jalaj is not fed, next morning he's going to make me look fatter than I am on the camera. So it's really a serious issue. But there was a God watching over me. We go in. The head waiter of this restaurant is Satinder from Bhatinda. All right? <laughs> so <laughs> whilst we all are nibbling our seven-course Parmesan meal, and let's face it, it was 12 days of shooting, and we were all eyeing Jalaj's food, Jalaj was eating his paratha, sabzi, hari mirch, Tabasco, all put together. And believe it or not, the meal for him ended with this tall aluminium glass of lassi. All right? And later he told us that Soranya, 80% of the Parmesan production is done by the Sikh community. So now we all know why Parmesan tastes so wonderful. It's got the good Punjabi hands working on it. Um, but seriously, I mean, Traveling Diva was a very easy book for me. It was, I mean, all I had to do was just jog my memory, think of all the recipes, all the places I'd visited, put it together, shake it in a cocktail shaker, and we had a book. But there was a good part to it also. All these travels, all these shoots, everything, all the travels, I could expense it as a business expense. So I've actually never paid for any of it myself. For a simple reason, every time I go, I find some new recipes to recreate my menus all over again. If I remember now in Cafe Diva, we have something called Gözleme. Gözleme is it's this Turkish paratha, basically. Very flaky, very crispy, filled with sheep milk, you know, cheese, very salty. And when I tasted it in Istanbul, I said, hang on. This is something which is really going to work with Indian palate, and it has, and it's been on the menu for seven years now. Then there was this other time when I met a self-proclaimed Caesar salad expert, and she told me very seriously, Caesar salad, no anchovies. Can you believe that? Extra garlic and only romaine leaves. And all our restaurants for the last 10 years have followed the same recipe, and that doesn't change. Or, I mean, there was a time when I was sitting very quietly in a small Bavarian village, you know, minding my own business. Then this waitress comes in and says, you've got to try our local speciality. I don't, I don't want, I want to think, I'm thinking, but okay, I'm not a rude person. So she, I said, what is it? She says, potato, mashed potato filled with apricot, covered with bread, butter, sugar, and flour. Doesn't sound very appetizing, but as I said, I'm a very polite person. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll try it. I took a bite, and on 13th of Feb, 2011, I discovered my most favorite dessert in the world. So, all's good. Life is good. It's not always good, I have to admit. You know, there's some hiccups as well. 
Um, I was in China. It was a family holiday. Nephew, nieces, um, grandparents, uncle, aunties, everyone, and I was a tour leader. So four days later, I have a bratty nephew and even a brattier niece who said, we want to eat a steak. I hope I won't get into trouble here. But, <laughs> okay, so we go into a restaurant and we say, my nephew wants to eat a steak. So the waitress didn't speak a word of English, of course, that's why the Indian IT business is thriving the way it is. So I try to explain to her, she doesn't understand, so I'm a genius. I draw a little cow and I said, steak, steak. She looks at it, she says, yes, we have. Bow wow, we have. I said, no, no bow wow, no bow wow. I want moo, moo. She said, meow, 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 meow. Yes, we have. So, <laughs> okay, we didn't get along, we didn't get a steak and we left. And uh, my friend's father, a very elegant gentleman, tells this waitress, young lady, you need to come to India to learn how to cook Chinese food. All right, in all seriousness. Later I was thinking, I mean, we were horrified because we didn't quite appreciate it, but that woman must be thinking, who are these strange people who come to our country and have no clue how delicious dog meat or cat meat can be? You know, she must have had her own point of view. So whether we like it or not, guys, to know it, you got to taste the culture. Um, then, apart from cats, snakes, etc., and donkey meat, I once ate donkey meat as well, and my sister still teases me mercilessly, donkey eating donkey, you know, sort of a situation. But there are other problems as well. I mean, you go to Vienna, for example, all right? The breakfast, flaky croissant, cafe melange with 100% cream milk in the coffee, you know, those almond pastries, sausages, 10,000 calories for a single breakfast. How can you say no to it? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a mere mortal, you know. So, those are other problems. Or if you go to Australia, the national motto is sweet, sweeter, sweetest. Take your pick. So, one little word of advice, if you want to go travel around the world, be, you know, little discipline is required. Because otherwise, when you come back, you may need an appointment, not only with your cardiologist, but maybe also your dentist. So, it's been good. It's really been good. But the best part about eating and traveling has been, I've really met some of the nicest people in the world during my travels. People have opened their homes to me, their kitchens to me, and their hearts. And sometimes I've even managed to get some cooking secrets out. And I truly believe a table is a great place to form bonds and to make new friends. And I really have been truly lucky where that's concerned. So all you guys here, I mean, you all are studying good, wonderful engineering and all. But there's another sort of education waiting for you right there. All you need to do is pack your bags, all right? Um, as James Mishner once said, that if you reject the food, if you ignore the people, or if you fear the religion, you guys might as well stay home. Thank you.